seemed like a long ways distance and lot, lots of uh, valleys to cross between here and yonder, but I don't know how long it's going to be before Jesus shows up. Who knows? Trumpet might sound before this service is over. And I'd just soon go to heaven from right here as somewhere else. And you? Praise the Lord. John chapter 18. Been preaching a series of messages on uh, being changed into the image of Jesus, looking at some characteristics of his life, some of his practices and actions, and uh, just trying to be more like him. Now, it's not something that we can drum up in the flesh. We established that, right? Uh, we can't just say, I'm going to be more like Jesus, read the historical record, and automatically be transformed. It comes through the Spirit of God. Uh, Galatians chapter 5 uh, talks about being uh, uh, a participant, a bearer of the, of the fruit of the Spirit. And that comes when we yield to the Holy Spirit of God. So we can't be like Jesus unless we yield to the Spirit. And uh, I want to be like Him. I think you do too. And I want to just say welcome for those who may be watching by way of the Internet tonight, live stream. could be somebody out there. Uh, that's just down and out and needs to be encouraged. Somebody might be here tonight, needs to be just encouraged. I hope the message will be encouraging to you tonight. I've entitled the message, I want to just give it to you up front. I've entitled the message, Resort Areas for Your Mind. <laughs> Resort Areas for Your Mind. When you get tired, when you get weary, you need a vacation. Ms. Erica was talking about her boss going on vacation. She's tired and weary and, and sick. And so maybe a little vacation time would help her. Uh, but sometimes it's you're just your body and you just need to heal. But sometimes in your mind you just get stressed, you get weighted down, you get weary, and, uh, and you just need to uh, have a resort time. Now I'm having trouble with this thing again. Let's see here. All right, there we go. And so tonight I want to try to be an encouragement to you. This is not... Uh, not exactly this, the kind of message that I've been bringing on Wednesday nights, but it's still the same type of subject matter, being more like Jesus. And uh, Jesus had to carry a heavy load, didn't he? Jesus carried a heavy load. I mean, he was the, the creator of mankind, and he came down to a sinful earth, away from uh, the sinlessness of heaven. And uh, I don't know what it would be like for Jesus. I don't know what it's like for us, but I don't know what it would be like for Jesus to be the creator walking among his created ones, being abused by those who he had created. And so it must have been very, very harsh environment for Jesus to be walking around and be abused, even though he was the king of heaven. Let's read two verses in John chapter 18. We'll read two verses and go from there. John 18, 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden. Now this garden is the Mount of Olives. Into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also. Hey, Judas might be one who would bring some stress in your life. Huh? Here's Jesus with his twelve disciples and one of them's a devil. And Judas also, verse 2, which betrayed him, knew the place. Now, I want you to get this last phrase of verse 2. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. We're going to take a little play on words tonight. He resorted. What did he do? What does it mean to resort? It, well, for Jesus, it meant to get away from all the hustle and bustle and all the crowds get away from everything that's going on, all of the, the Pharisees who had been chasing him and, and bad-mouthing him, and away from all the, the hungry people who were begging him for food. He got away from everybody that was causing him a lot of stress, and he resorted to the garden at Gethsemane. I've seen the garden of Gethsemane, stood up on top of the Mount of Olives and looked down on the garden of Gethsemane. The Mount of Olives... Uh, was a favorite place uh, of Jesus as well as the garden. And uh, this, they say some of the same trees still grow there that was growing at the time of Jesus. Some of the very trees that Jesus may have leaned up against still grow there. That resort place, a place to 
find rest. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us rest tonight. Lord, our minds may be weary. Our flesh may be weary. There could be stress. There could be problems and frustrations and demands on our time and on our emotions, on our body, on our money. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to find some resort areas where we can rest our mind. I pray that you'd bless in Jesus' name. Amen. People travel faster, more often than ever before. I mean, all you got to do is just, on Facebook, I see almost every day, I see somebody that's on an airplane going somewhere. Uh, used to be trains back when I was a kid. You know, people went somewhere, they went on a train or a bus. And before that, I guess it's covered wagons or stagecoach. And then before that, it's horse or mule or wagon. And, uh, and then in Jesus' time, most of them just hoofed it. They just walked wherever they went. And, uh, but people travel more now. And this is a busy old world. And uh, when I was a kid, we didn't travel much. <coughs> I mean, <coughs> we went to Melbourne. It's 13 miles from where we lived out in the country to Melbourne, the county seat. And uh, it was a little bitty place. And we'd go to Melbourne on Saturday, maybe once, maybe twice a month, and get a few groceries. So we didn't travel much. About once or twice a year, we'd go to Baseball. <laughs> Baseball was a big city, and uh, so we didn't travel a lot. We never went on a vacation, ever. Uh, we just didn't go anyplace. That's why I guess I'm still a homebody. I kind of like being around home, and we just didn't travel. But there was a, a resort place for me. I didn't travel to the Caribbean, didn't travel to Florida, didn't travel to Hawaii, didn't travel to uh, any of the the uh, famous sites in America. I didn't go to Yosemite or to Yellowstone or, or uh, to the Smoky Mountains. Didn't go to any of those places. But just across the hollow from where I grew up, grew up on the hillside, and just across the hollow was my grandpa's house. He was Papa. Now, I know we've got all kinds of different names. You know, there's not very many Papas around anymore. There are few. And, uh, and the name Grandma has all but disappeared. You know, now we got Nini and Nunu and Mimi and Moo Moo and, and uh, Nana and all of these funny little names. And, I mean, my grandparents were Granny and Papa. <laughs> and uh, that's the way I remember it. I would go over to Papa's house. And it was just not less than about a quarter of a mile. And uh, I'd walk over there, and that was my resort place. Stay all night once in a while. Now, that's to me. Staying all night then lasted longer than going out for a week's vacation would now. Staying all night was a long time. I mean, boy, it was Grandpa went to bed at 5 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a long, long night. I mean, I had to lay there for a long time to go to sleep. And uh, I didn't have to lay there long to get up. Grandpa wanted to get up at 4.30. Well, he wanted Grandma to get up at 4.30 and cook breakfast. He'd lay in bed till about 5.30. She got it all ready, and then he'd go in there and eat about half a biscuit, and then they'd fuss about him not eating what she wanted, what she fixed for him. But I remember going down and sleeping on the old beds. The old, that old bed, that, that holds wonderful memories to me. I mean, old, those old springs, I mean, they didn't know what an inner spring mattress was. That old bed's creak and scrape, and you had to lay real still or you'd be awake all night from the screaking on those old rusty springs. And, and quilts, I'm talking about quilts. Granny would have quilts piled up that deep on the bed. I mean, you couldn't turn over at night. There were so many beds quilts on the bed that was my resort area I mean that was my holiday inn and I'd go and spend the night there I remember in the summertime uh, laying there in the bed and uh, it would come up a, a little gentle rain like we've had this afternoon you hear the rain pitter pattern on that old tin roof didn't have any insulation in the house I mean you could hear the rain real well <laughs> and uh, and so you listen to the rain falling on the roof hey that was my resort area that was a peaceful place. I remember going down there and just sitting and listening to the rain and got, brought great, great peace. Uh, I remember the outhouse. <laughs> the outhouse was way too far away in wintertime and way too close in the summertime. <laughs> remember the old log house. They had an old log shed out back. And uh, that old, we called it the log house. And it was kind of what people would have as an outside storage building now. Everything under the sun was stored in that old log house. And me and my cousins, uh, my grandparents raised my cousins, 
and they were a little bit younger than me, Billy and Carolyn, and we'd go out there in that old log house and we'd dig through all of the old relics. I mean, there was stuff in there from way back yonder. I mean, we, we'd dig out the old Victrola, you know, and had the hand crank on it. You crank the Victrola and it'd wind up a spring in it and you put a 78 RPM record disc on the turntable and put that old needle. It had an old needle. It looked like a toothpick sticking out of it. And uh, you'd crank that thing up and it'd go, wah, 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 wah. And, and we thought it was singing. <laughs> and uh, listen to that old Victrola and, uh, and, and get into a box of Aunt Faye's love letters she'd wrote to her boyfriend when he was in the service. And we'd, she had them all in there, whole big box of letters. Man, this was better than any kind of magazine that you could ever think about. I mean, the National Enquirer didn't have nothing, man. And we'd dig those old letters out and read them and, and stick them back. And, and uh, oh, there was something therapeutic about going up to that old log house and just digging through all the old stuff that's in there from decades gone by before the turn of the of the of the 20th century and uh, then we'd go down to the little creek down there and there's a little swimming pool little sw swimming hole just an old muddy creek we'd jump in there ice cold water but we thought we were really living it up that that was our resort area we had a we had a creek there's a there's a pool about uh, half as big as this platform and, uh, and and we'd jump in there and paddle around in the water and, and that was a resort area Get away from everything, man, we're just there. And uh, making teepees out in the, out in the uh, field, Grandpa would raise uh, sorghum cane, and he had them shocked up. Now, the young people don't know what shocks are, but they'd take that sorghum cane stalks, like corn stalks, and they'd, they'd pile them all up together, and uh, they'd be together at the top, the little narrow tops, and then they'd spread out at the bottom and shaped like an Indian teepee. Oh, we'd start pulling stalks out, and Grandpa didn't know that. <laughs> and we pulled stalks out from the center of it and hollow it out, and you could go inside of it. We had teepee in there. That was our resort area. And uh, we'd go gather some blackberries, boysenberries, and uh, plums. All that stuff just grew everywhere. This Garden of Eden, resort area. <laughs> and uh, I remember the wintertime sitting in the living room by in Granny's old rocker and everybody else was gone I'd sit around and Granny would be sitting across in another rocking chair on the other side of the old heating stove and, and uh, the smell of smoke very strong from the wood that was burning in the in the wood burning stove and we'd be sitting there and Granny would begin to talk and, and she had that monotonous voice that was, oh listen if you think your preacher is boring you ought to listen to my grandma, oh my she was, she was sweet, sweet, sweet elderly lady uh, but she'd be sitting there and, and she'd, be, uh, she'd be talking, she'd be knitting something, you know, and she'd start talking to me and telling me about old times. And this is better than going to the movies, man. Really, it was interesting to listen to her. But it went on for quite a while, and her voice was just at that tone where it just kind of hummed me to sleep. Hum, you know, and I'd, I'd go to sleep in the rocking chair as she's knitting away and telling her stories about when she was a little girl. And uh, I'd go to sleep sitting by that warm fire. I'd wake up a half hour later, and she's still in her story, you know. She's still knitting away. She never knew I went to sleep. Resort area. It was peaceful. And then Christmas time, Granny and Papa's house. Christmas time, there'd be a little bit of oranges and apples. About the only time of year we had oranges and apples, and you smell those fr freshly peeled oranges, oh, those orange peelings through the place. And a cedar tree, Christmas tree by the old, uh, sitting over in the corner away from the stove, and and a fresh cut cedar tree, you smell that thing, resort area. This was peace. I'm talking about peaceful stuff. You don't need, you don't need tranquilizers. You don't need pills. You don't need drugs. You don't need a therapist. I mean, you're just, this is a resort area. And then springtime would come. And the freshly plowed garden and the fields. Grandpa behind an old mule. Gee, ha! Getting that old mule to go right or left and smelling that dirt that's just been turned over in the springtime and some, you smell a little bit of smoke in the air people burning off the leaves off of their garden plots and a few fire bugs burning off the woods <laughs> and there's just something about the smell of all that it's just, it's just peaceful and in summertime I remember sitting on the front porch I'd look over at my grandpa every once in a while hot summertime the haze across the 
hollow there, and he'd, he'd be sitting in his rocking chair with his old pipe. I don't know. I think he smoked old rubber inner tubes in it or something. It smelled awful. He'd be sitting there with that old pipe in his mouth, puffing away, and uh, always had an old hat on, and uh, not a cap, but a hat, you know, a brim hat, and uh, always wore uh, gray-colored gray khakis and, and, uh, and a khaki shirt, sitting there with his glasses on and puffing on his pipe and looking across the hollow, and he's gazing somewhere into a whole nother world. I don't know what he saw, but he was just at perfect peace, gazing off into the distance. It was peaceful for me just to watch him. Talking about resort areas. This was my resort area. This was better than being in a recliner, in a reclining uh, beach chair, listening to the ocean waves. Once in a while, we would go to the river. Grandpa liked to fish. We'd go to Lock and Dam number three down at Batesville and sat below the dam and fish there and something about that place, listening to the music. This was my resort area. Listening to the, the waters come over that dam was like an orchestra playing in my ears. And uh, just sitting on that old gravel bar was my beach. Smelling dead fish laying on the bank from some other fisherman was perfume to my nose. <laughs> and these were times that I'll never forget and they'll linger forever in my mind. And these are resort places in my childhood. Well, you may have some resort areas in your mind. You may have some fond memories of things that you did when you were younger, or maybe things that you do now. And places you can go and places you can just be alone or places where you feel relaxed and places where you can unwind and, and get all refreshed again. We need resort areas in our life because things get tough on us too. Things get kind of hectic. Things get kind of frustrating. And, and, and our flesh and our mind just gets weary. And we need a place to resort to. Jesus took his disciples oftentimes and they would go to the Mount of Olives or down in the Garden of Gethsemane and they would just rest under those trees. And I guess they could hear the at nighttime hear the the uh, chirp of the crickets and uh, just the quietness, maybe smell a little bit of the smoke from, from the fireplace and some people's houses where they're cooking supper. And they just resorted there. That's where Jesus went to get away from everything. Now, there were some places where Jesus went. He went to that Garden of Gethsemane, and he also went oftentimes to Bethany. He had some friends there, Mary and Martha and, uh, and Lazarus, brother and his sisters, and and oftentimes Jesus would go there and he'd take his disciples with him and that was just a special place, being at Bethany. This was the place where Jesus could relax and kick back and just take it easy for a little while and unwind with his disciples. We need a resort place. That's where Jesus resorted to. You know what a resort place is? It's a place where you want to go back to. Now I can't go back to Granny and Papa's old house it's gone. Even the little old creek's gone. The old log house, everything's gone. They say you, you can't go back home, <laughs> except in our minds. But we need some resort areas. And I want to share with you three spots tonight that you can go to. Whether they've torn down any of your old places where you might resort to or whether, whether you can't hop on a plane and fly to some commercial resort, there are three places where I want to remind you from the Bible that you can go for some rest and relaxation. Number one, resort area, the day of your salvation. The day of your salvation, this is a peaceful place. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace. Peace. I want to emphasize that word. Peace. You know what's wrong with people today? We don't have much peace. We've got a lot of entertainment, but not much peace. We have jobs, but not much peace. We have family, but not a lot of peace. We have places to go, but not a lot of peace. We may have a lot of money. Some people do. It seems like they still don't have much peace. But if you remember, listen, friend, if you remember the day of your salvation, 
you were lost and condemned and your heart was weary, your labor was weary, your mind was weary, there was fear and doubt and you wanted to be saved. Remember when you got saved? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. They say everything is relative. So when you put your troubles, and listen to me, when you put your troubles in proper perspective, oftentimes they don't seem as bad when you compare them to something else. If you put your troubles and your heartaches today in perspective, the day before you got saved, friend, you really had trouble. You had trouble. If you'd have died, you'd have gone smack dab into the middle of hell before you got saved. And your heart was troubled or you, about it or you wouldn't have gotten saved. Nobody gets saved that's not concerned about their soul. And maybe you were deep into sin or maybe not so far, but you knew you were lost and hell was going to be your home just the same. And, and uh, that day, that day, that you trusted Jesus as your Savior is a very sweet day and it can bring sweet peace back into your life when things are not going so well. Remember the day you got saved. Now somebody might be watching or listening on audio and you may have a troubled heart right now and you might say, well, I don't really have peace with God. You can have peace with God. There's no battle that I face today that compares to the battle that Jesus won for me on the cross of Calvary. When he fought and won against the devil that day, the day I accepted him, April 13, 1980, my worst problem in the whole world went away. <laughs> Saved. Saved. That's a, good, that's a good word, isn't it? Saved. I like to say it. Some people say, well, you can't know that you're going to make it to heaven until you actually die and see if you made it or not. The problem with that kind of thinking is if you didn't do the right thing, it's too late to do anything about it. The Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The Bible says that if you call on the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. And so I called on him April 13, 1980, and the transaction was done. You see, it didn't depend upon me. All I had to do was just accept what he did. Now, if you're struggling trying to work for your salvation, you won't know. You can't have peace. And your life will be full of trouble. And your sleep will be restless at times because you don't know if you're going to heaven or not. I know. There's some things I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. I don't know if I'll have any money or any health tomorrow. I don't know if I'll have a friend tomorrow, except for Jesus. I know I'm saved, and I know I've got heaven to look forward to. So look, the worst thing that can happen to me is that I'll die. But is that bad? It's just opening a door into eternal life. Not so bad. Amen. I'm talking about resort areas in your life. If you have a day at a place and a time, or you might not remember the, the date like I can because I wrote mine down, but you might not remember the date, but you ought to be able to remember something about where you were or what you thought. You ought to remember something about the experience when you got saved. If there is no particular time in your life when you got saved, you may just have religion and not salvation. But if you've been born again, you know the, the point where you got saved, when you were born again. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you're saved tonight, friend, you've got a lot to be thankful for, and there's no sweeter time in your entire life than the day of your salvation. Think back on it. That's a resort area. Do you remember when you were saved? Not, I said not the date, but you remember you were saved, and you know you came to Christ. Well, number two. Well, let, 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 me, let me give you a verse before I leave that to go to number two. If, if you don't, maybe somebody's watching on the Internet, if you don't know about your own salvation, Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 gives you an invitation. 
And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs Jesus his life, but it don't cost you anything. Isn't that great? Where else can you get a deal like that? Trade your sin in for a clean slate, the righteousness of Christ. Where else? See, next time you're having a bad day, remember, if you're saved, you have something as a resort area you can go back to. Number two, the place of your service. This is a restful place as well. The place of your service. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come unto me. Jesus said this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. Now notice that. Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is? <coughs> now, going back to my childhood days, <laughs> some of those old timers had a yoke. They'd just take an old bush that had a, it was just a, it's just a bush maybe that big around and it grew up about this high and the trunk forked out that way and they'd cut that fork off and it was like a kind of like a peace symbol <laughs> I guess and, and they'd take that old uh, Y shaped stick and put it up under the cow's throat or the goat whatever they had and then tie a leather strap across from fork to fork and that fork fit up under there and, the, and like two sticks sticking up above and one sticking down below and so when the, that rogue of a calf tried to get over there and go through the fence that yoke would get hung up in the fence they couldn't go through now there's another kind of yoke there's a yoke where you put two horses or two oxen together two mules together and you harness them together in a yoke so that they're both pulling a, a common item like a plow or a wagon and uh, some farm imp implement and they're yoked together going the same way pulling the same load when you got two in the yoke it makes it a whole lot easier than when one's in the yoke doesn't it <laughs> two can pull a yoke better than one and if one is Jesus that makes it a whole lot different I saw a little picture a little meme on Facebook the other day it showed You've seen these little paintings of, uh, of the tracks in the sand and where Jesus carried you, you know. This one was a little bit different. This one had two pictures. One of them uh, shows a guy that's supposed to be Jesus talking to another man, and he says to him, he says, Well, where you see just two prints, two footprints in the sand, that's where I carried you. He said, Where you see two prints in the sand and in a long rut, that's where I dragged you, kicking and screaming. <laughs> We're kind of that way sometimes, aren't we? When Jesus is in the yoke with us, the burden is light. Let's read the rest of that verse. Come unto me. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Hey, this is not a rest from labor that he's talking about. When we get saved, God doesn't mean for us to sit down on our blessed assurance and never do anything anymore. He means when we get saved, we can rest from our labor of trying to work our way to heaven, and now we can serve Him with assurance that we're already as good as there, but we serve Him out of gratitude. And here's, here's the thing to keep, in, to keep in mind about it. Every so often, after we get saved, we get a little bit weary in the service of the Lord. God meant for us to serve, didn't he? He meant for us to serve. Nod your head. God meant for us to serve, but don't you get tired sometimes? There's times when I've been tired. There's been times when, I, I'm honest with you, there's been times when I didn't want to go to the pulpit. I thought, man, let Brother Denny do it. <laughs> let Brother Al do it. Anybody but me. I don't want to go. That was one of those times when Jesus pulled me kicking and screaming. Like one guy said to me, he said, hey, uh, he was, the, the conversation was, well, somebody called my number the other night, 2.30 uh, in the morning, somebody dialed my number, and uh, so I, I did what any man of the house would do, I kicked my wife, told her to answer the phone. <coughs> she answered the phone, nobody was there. Well, she could hear some noise in the background, so that sounded like people, you know, talking, moving about, but nobody answered. It may have been an accidental call, I don't know. 
And so I, I had uh, made the statement when I went to bed that night. I said, for once in, once in a long time, I'm going to bed early tonight. I want to get a good long night's sleep. 2.30 the phone rang. Well, after she hung it back up, you know, I, I thought, now, I wonder if I can get back to sleep. Well, I was able to go back to sleep. And it was very sweet sleep until 3.30 a.m. And it rang again. Somebody accidentally called the number again. She said, hello, and nobody's there. And uh, so talking to a guy about that situation, he said, well, next time that happens, you ought to read them some scripture or witness to them or something. I said, listen, I'm just not that spiritual at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> He said, you took the job 24-7. <laughs> but it, hey, we all get tired in the service of the Lord, don't we? You get tired with, I know you love your family, but sometimes you get tired. You probably love the work you do, but sometimes you get tired. You have a job to do for the Lord. Sometimes you come to, you wake up on Sunday morning and you think, man, I don't think I want to go to church today, you know? It's a good thing you can't lose your salvation or some of you would have lost it over this not going to church thing. <laughs> and we just get tired in the service of the Lord. But when you get tired, you can find rest. Jesus said, take my yoke upon on you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your soul. You know what we need to do? Here's the conclusion to point number two. You ready? If we had to fill in the blank, this would be fill in the blank. When you're weary in the work, don't quit. Go to your resort, Jesus. Sometimes people think, man, it's just this visitation thing. You know, on Thursday nights, this visitation thing. I'd kind of like to do that, but man... I just got too much going on in life. I, can't, I just can't spare another night. And besides that, I'm scared. <laughs> and I'm just worn out. I don't want to have to do anything else. Matthew 28, 17. Now, here's, here's how you can go to, go to Jesus and rest. Matthew 28, 17. This is where he gives the great commission about where we're supposed to go and witness to the lost. Matthew 28, 17, and when they saw him, the disciples, when they saw him, they worshipped him. They worshipped him. That's a good thing, isn't it? And look what it says right after that. But some, what? Doubted. They're worshiping and doubting. If you have times of doubt, you have times of weariness, you have times when you wonder if you really ought to try to do anything else for the Lord or not, well, you're not the first one that doubted. But let's read on. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Well, that's where your power comes from. That's why we need to resort to Jesus in times of weakness. Verse 19, he says, Go ye, therefore. What is that talking about? That's Thursday night visitation. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with most of the time, always. Now, when, we, when we're feeling weary about serving the Lord, what do we need to do? Make Him our place of resort. We resort to Him and say, Lord, wait, I don't feel like going. I don't feel like serving. I don't want to teach that class. I don't want to sing. I don't want to do anything. I just want to rest. I don't even want to go to church. And what does Jesus say? All power is given to me. So he's where the power is at. Then what does he say? Go ye. So that's what I'm supposed to do. What if I don't feel like it? I've got to believe that the power is in him, and if I'll go, then he'll do his part, and he says, I am with you always. So, see, it's kind of a test. When you feel like throwing in the towel, remember that it's not your power that he's depending on. He just wants you to follow him. He just wants you to go and he'll be with you. He's your resort area. <laughs> By the way, I'm thinking about changing uh, Thursday night visitation. Brother Aaron and I were talking about it yesterday and uh, thinking about doing something different. I mean, we don't have, we don't have a lot of participation on Thursday night. 
You just have a few people come on Thursday night, a few come on Saturday morning, and uh, it's not working out real good. So uh, they say, uh, you know, they say it's crazy to keep repeating the same things that's failed before. So maybe we'll try something different. And here's, here's what we talked about. Another preacher's been doing this, uh, giving, making a, uh, a list of maybe five or ten addresses and those who are interested in going. Instead of saying, hey, we do it on Thursday night, just give you a list on Sunday. You've got five addresses or ten, and you go make them you, your family, or a partner, whoever you want to go with, and you just go sometime during the week. You knock on, I just if you knock on five doors, we'll be way ahead of where we are now. I said, we'd be way ahead of where we are now. Fine. This, this other preacher is doing that, and uh, he was in pretty much the same scenario. Nobody's coming, him, him and his wife, maybe two or three, coming on Thursday nights. So he started giving out a list of 10, 10 addresses to people who were interested. It was no push, no shove, no coercion. Just, hey, if you're interested, here's 10 addresses. And he had uh, a couple or two to decide they were going to do that. And so they went out, and they just during the week, whenever they felt like they had uh, the time to invest, they'd go out and, and knock on those 10 doors. What'd it take? 45 minutes, hour, and uh, and make those 10 contacts. And if the uh, if the people they talked, they didn't have to go into anything elaborate. Just if those people were very interested, they'd write down their name and address and hand it to the pastor, and the pastor would go back and make a follow up. They'd send out a letter thanking them, and then uh, go back and make the pastor would go back and make a part of personal contact, and try to win them to the Lord if if they didn't get saved the first time around. And uh, now now they have their they're having about 250 hours of visitation being invested every week. And the church has gone from 25 to 200, 200, about 200 people in a year. Well, we can't do that. <laughs> I mean, Jesus is strong over yonder, but you couldn't expect him to do it here, <laughs> could we? Not if you move to, to uh, Nashville. You've got to stay here, buddy. <laughs> so all power is given to Jesus. Where's our resort area? Our resort area is in Jesus. Number three, and I'll be done. Your place of surrender. Your salvation, your service, and number three, your surrender. Your place of surrender. Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. There it is. Sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some of us came to a place in our life somewhere along the line where we did what Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 is talking about. We came to a place where we said, Lord, yeah, I'm saved, but you know, I've kind of reserved some areas of my life where I didn't want you to bother me. <laughs> you know? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm saved, Lord, but you know, there's just a few areas in my life where I'd rather you wouldn't bother me. There's some things that I've just, some things I've reserved for myself, and I, I'd just rather you wouldn't be poking around those areas. When we get to the place of surrender, if our body in which the Holy Spirit lives is the house of the Lord, we call this the house of the Lord, the church house. But really, you know where the house of the Lord is. If you're saved, he lives in you. He dwells in you. And so if our body is the house of the Lord, and if there's rooms in there, when we surrender, here's what surrender is. We just go through and kick all the doors open. Every one of them, kick that door open, that door open, that door open, that door open, and get a hold of that one door where we really didn't want the Lord to go in and there and open that door up and say, Lord, it's all yours. You go in any room of my life you please. If you see something in there, Lord, that's, that's not pleasing to you, feel free to sweep it out. Now that's surrender. I remember stumbling around in the backyard of an old house over on Guyon Road when I was 
trying to respond to the Lord when he was calling me to preach. I remember walking around that cold October night, walking back and forth across the yard. The stars were shining, but there's no moon out, and it's dark, and I'm tripping over things, and I'm walking and talking to the Lord, and I'm saying, Lord, you know, you know I've surrendered everything to you. And, and, and this thing about you calling me to preach, you know, if I was sure that you really want me to preach, I'd go ahead and surrender. But, Lord, you hadn't told me. You hadn't just come out and said it. You hadn't just come out and said you want me to preach. I kind of suspect you do. But I just, somehow, I just don't want to do it because I'm not sure. It's kind of like the, the Lord is just saying, <laughs> if you'll shut up, I'll speak. Sometimes, you know, the Bible talks about that still, small voice. Sometimes we need to just get alone with the Lord and just shut up. I mean, I'm, I'm being respectful as best I can, but we need to just clam up and say, Lord, I'm listening for you. And I finally said, you know, Lord, if you really want me to preach, if this is what you want me to do, I've said that I would surrender. And so, Lord, all I know to do is just say yes if that's what you want me to do. If you don't want me to surrender, you better tell me something. You hadn't said anything. You hadn't said yes out loud. But if you don't want me to preach, you better say something, Lord. You better protest because I think you want me to preach. I'm going to surrender tomorrow at church if you don't tell me not to. He didn't tell me not to. You say, how do you know he called you? Well, he hadn't killed me yet. <laughs> I'm kind of like John R. Rice. Somebody said, Brother Rice, when did you surrender to preach publicly? He said, well, I don't remember making a public surrender to preach. Uh, he said, I just remember that somebody, after I got saved, he said, I, I began to witness to some people, and the church over yonder called me and asked me if I'd come in and uh, hold a little youth meeting and speak to their young people, and I did, and and then another church heard about it, and they asked me to come over there and speak to the young, their young people, and I did. And, and another one wanted me to come and, and preach a, an evangelistic uh, meeting, and so I did. And he said, next thing you know, it's 50 years later, and God had never told me to quit. Maybe we just need to surrender to some things. Understand God hadn't called everybody to preach. But we ought to be willing to if he asked us to. We ought to be willing to do whatever he calls us to do. None of us are happy and restful in an unsurrendered life. There's, there may be something you're hanging on to. There may be something that you treasure that you haven't surrendered. It could be your children. It could be your wife. It could be your husband. It could be your job. It could be some habit. It could be some involvement in the Lord's work. It could be a number of things. I can't guess them all. But you know if the Lord's been bothering you about it. And, uh, and if you're bothered about it and there's something that you feel like you need to surrender, here, here's the way I would do it. I tell young people this, if you don't know what to surrender to, just give God a blank check and say, Lord, whatever it is, I surrender all. And then you agree to do whatever he writes on the check. You say, that could be dangerous. Yeah, we can't trust God very far, can we? <laughs> he might send us to Africa or the North Pole. <laughs> or he may want us to sing or be a Sunday school teacher or work on a bus route. Whatever it is that we're holding back, we just need to surrender because after you surrender, there's a feeling of freshness, rest. It's a resort area that place of surrender. The horse that gets the clean water and the warm barn and the fresh oats and the hay is not the horse that's running wild. It's the horse that's surrendered to his master. The happy man is the one who surrendered to the Lord. The happy woman is the one who surrendered to the Lord. The happy boy or girl is the one who surrendered to the Lord. You may ask, surrender what? Just surrender to whatever he wants. It might be an attitude. It might be a desire. It might be a habit. It might be service. It might be to preach or be a missionary. It might be a, just to be a, a faithful church member. But there's something extremely heavy about carrying around an unsurrendered spirit. 
And if you want a resort area you can go to and feel refreshed, just like you can about your salvation, you surrender to the Lord and you'll have a fresh resort area to go to. So I can't go back to Papa's old house. It's gone. But I can go to the resort area of my salvation. And I can go to the resort area of my service. And I can go to the resort area of my surrender. And those are fresh places where I can feel relaxed and say everything's all right in my Father's house. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? Father, thank you for your special invitation to take your yoke upon us. Lord, I pray. For all the people under the sound of my voice, whether it's in this room or on the internet or audio recording, Lord, I pray that each one would ask themselves first, am I saved and know it? Lord, you said in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Lord, I pray that those who may have doubts may wonder if they're really saved. I pray that they'd come to the place tonight where they just surrender to you for salvation and get it settled once for all forever. And Lord, for those who have been holding back on their service or their surrender, Lord, I pray that you'd help them tonight just to say, I, I give up. Lord, whatever you want is what I'll give you. And Lord, I pray you'd bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand, please? There is an altar if you want to come and do business with God. He'll meet you here. You say, well, I'm sure I'm saved and do serve the Lord. And I think I surrendered one time. <laughs> 